It is the first week of December, and Walt Disney is standing in the Pan Pacific Auditorium in Los Angeles. He's hiding against the wall, in the shadows, watching the public react to something he made himself. The moment is bittersweet. Eleven years ago, Walt's world took a turn when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and drew the U.S. into World War II. Four years ago, he built himself a train, and the following year had it installed at his house. Since then, much has changed. Where once he dreamed of a park, only to put the idea on the shelf because of time and cost, he now finds himself actively planning one. Everything is still in the development stages, but the scope is growing, day by day, and that's not even why he's here. Walt's here to see the end result of a blind alley, a path he chased while the studio struggled for money, a struggle to find its place in the post-war American landscape. It started almost five years ago, when Walt began collecting miniatures. At first, these were for decorating his model railroad in his office, and then for decorating the larger-scale railroad in his yard. Three years ago, in the summer of 1949, Walt met a man in London. Walt was in the UK due to complicated protectionist monetary policy that summarized meant that the money Disney films made in the UK had to be spent there. As a result, Walt launched a live-action film production of Treasure Island, with the shoot beginning on July 4th. Under the guise of being there to supervise production, Disney took his family and spent an extended summer vacation in Europe. While in London, Walt met a man in a miniature shop named Harper Goff, while they both admired the same Lionel train set. Walt offered Goff, an artist, a job when he came back to Hollywood. The Disney family left for the United States after five weeks, but Walt returned without them in late September to finish the movie. In between those trips, the Soviet Union detonated its first atomic bomb and the world took its first solid steps into the Cold War. The following March was a landmark for Disney, both the studio and the man. Studio business had drawn Walt away from his dreams of an amusement park three years ago. Through the winter of 1950, that studio business never let up. After the war, Disney had diversified, and Walt had a lot on his hands. Instead of producing only animated shorts and the occasional animated feature, the studio used the experience learned making training films during the war to pivot into other forms of education. Most notable of these were the true life adventures, nature documentaries with as much fantasy to them as truth. In addition, the studio released several anthologies of animated shorts and the live-action animation hybrids Song of the South and So Dear to My Heart. All of these films either underwhelmed, faced controversy, or made just enough money to cover cost. Even So Dear to My Heart, which will go on to net over $1 million, won't do so for almost two more years. The studio continued making shorts, but their last animated feature was Bambi in 1942, which flopped. All the while, the studio's creditors and stockholders expected to see larger returns. There was one animated feature in gestation since before the war that the bank would allow the studio to work on. There were a couple others allowed to progress through planning, but only Cinderella proceeded through production. When it released, in March of 1950, it was hailed as a return to form for Disney and for the studio. It will end 1950 as the sixth highest grossing film of that year, making $8 million on a $3 million budget. Early in 1950, Walt pulled layout artist Ken Anderson off the studio payroll. He put Anderson in a special office on the animation building's third floor. They were the only ones with keys. Walt assigned Anderson a special task. Draw two dozen scenes of turn-of-the-century Americana, quote, like Norman Rockwell, which Walt would turn into scale models. Walt forgets to pay Anderson for the first few weeks, and when he realizes his mistake, 
pays him, according to Anderson himself, more than Anderson could have ever saved in his lifetime. Unbeknownst to anyone, Walt took the first of these drawings, a grandmother sitting in a cabin, home. In the workshed behind his new house on Carrollwood Drive, where his scale railroad was currently being installed, Walt began work on building this miniature cabin. Walt had already made some small pot-bellied stoves, which he had sold in specialist stores. Now, he imagined turning his backyard railroad into a western town, replete with scenes created from Anderson's designs. But as with all of Walt's ideas, this one will outgrow its original intent. He spent the summer of 1950 in Europe again, overseeing another live-action production, Across the globe, North Korea invaded South Korea, sparking war. A few weeks later, the studio released Treasure Island, following up Cinderella with yet another box office success, netting the studio $2.3 million. The Disneys were also in talks for the studio's first television program, but more on that next time. Now, in December of 1952, Walt watches as the public crowds around his miniature cabin, he was here last week as well for the opening of the display. Had a hopper, famous Hollywood gossip columnist, admired the project. She asked why Disney did it. Walt told her, damned if I know. In truth, he was hiding his original intent, which was far grander than the current display. Through the latter half of 1950, the United Nations sent troops into Korea pushed the Northern Army back towards the Chinese border, only for the Chinese to join the war and push them back. At the end of the year, UN forces were regrouping to hold the 38th parallel. By the following January, Walt's idea had grown enough that he needed specialist help. He wrote an expert in display cases about how best to show one-eighth scale scenes to the public. He claimed he would have a, quote, pretty good show worked up by next Christmas. Walt sought help with his miniatures at the studio as well. He enlisted Roger Brogy, the machinist who helped him make the miniature railroads for his office and his yard. He also brought in two studio sculptors, Wathel Rogers, who started as an animator, and Charles Cristodoro. Ken Anderson completed his 24 drawings and returned to the studio to work on Alice in Wonderland. Meanwhile, Harper Goff, having met Walt Disney in London 18 months ago, began working at the studio on a true-life adventure film inspired by the Jules Verne work 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. While he was drawing concept art, Walt pulled him off the project to work with the others on the miniatures. With the team assembled, Walt revealed his plan to them. Anderson scenes, a blacksmith reading a newspaper in front of his forge, a minister in a pulpit, a group of gossiping women, and a general store, among others, were to be converted not just into static scenes, but living animations. Figures would move and interact, and a pre-recorded audio track would play. The figures would be based on wind-up mechanical toys Walt brought back from his European trips. He showed them his first unfinished cabin scene, and assigned them to make the others. Walt was still unsure of how to show the project to the public, but he did have a name. He called his project Disneyland. Yeah. Disneylandia. It's a stupid name, but it predates by a few months the first written example of Disneyland, which was used to reference a release of old Snow White promos for the RKO Salesforce. The team set to work on a scene of a dancing figure. Actor Buddy Ebsen was known for doing a certain type of comedic dance, and in February, Walt called him into the studio to film some reference material for the Disneylandia team. Using a grid set up on the studio soundstage for Peter Pan references, Ebsen performed his routine. For the following months, the team tried over and over to replicate Ebsen's dance, only to find that his movements were too random and the figure's clothes never fell in quite the right way. 
Walt still loved it, declared it a success, and had them move on to their next project, a barbershop quartet. Walt now had his first mechanical man. His next one, a far more famous subject, would take 13 more years. Even in late 1952, as Walt watches the crowds around the display, the cabin is still just a static scene. A recording of the actress who played Granny Kincaid in So Dear to My Heart plays as she talks to the viewers about her day. The scene is absorbing, but otherwise the display is a miniature cabin, and nothing more. While the machinists and sculptors worked on the dancing man, Walt had Harper Goff take a break from the Disneylandia project to work on the Mickey Mouse Village, drawing an overhead conception of the Burbank Park on the lot across from the studio. Walt had Goff make these drawings after a meeting with ABC television executives. We'll get more into Walt's TV dealings next episode, but this was an early conceptual meeting for the companies. The problem was, Walt dominated the meeting, talking about nothing but his park. Some of the executives were intrigued, but most were confused. They couldn't see it the way Walt did. So after returning to the studio, he instructed Goff to make something they could see. These are the results, overlaid on the modern Google map of the area. As with the memo for the park Walt wrote three years before, this depiction has the main village, carnival, old farm, western town, Native American village, and steamboat. The train does indeed circle the entire park as well. Walt took the concept from Goff and had John Cowles, the architect's son of an early benefactor in Kansas City, Dr. J. V. Cowles, convert Goff's concepts into architectural drawings. Walt also enlisted animator Don DeGrady to draw some sketches of the park. By the next month, March 1951, Walt had an idea for how to show Disneylandia. The solution was for the displays to be loaded into special train cars and pulled across the country to various cities. Once on site, they would be installed in a special location, possibly with Walt's miniature yard train installed to go through the little town. This idea proved unfeasible at best, as transporting the miniatures on a bouncing, moving train would damage them enough. Transporting them off the train would be even worse. By the time Walt approached Harry Tittle, head of shorts production, the idea was to house all the displays in cabinets based on jukeboxes. Local children could visit the train, drop a coin in the slot, and watch the scene play. Walt asked Harry to look into the logistics of touring the exhibition. He saw the exhibit as a means of educating children on how life was once lived in the United States. His plan, however, had a potentially fatal flaw, one that became evident when Disney visited potential locations in train yards. The idea of children attempting to cross the tracks to visit the Disney displays while trains moved around them was obviously flawed. Train hopping, a common enough occurrence in Walt's childhood, was no longer a thing. Modern trains were faster and more powerful than the steam trains Walt adored. But the accident on the Carrollwood Pacific, Walt's miniature railroad, was still in the future. To his credit, when he saw the modern train yards, Walt had doubts. The news from Tittle's logistics research was just as bad. Most railroad companies declined the plan outright. One railroad that actually considered the idea required $13,000 a month to install and maintain a Disney Spur line, an extra length of track off from the main lines to house the carriages of displays. As if the project needed any more nails in its coffin, the maintenance on the 1 8th scale animated figures would drive costs even higher. And thus, Disneylandia died. Walt was never one to let a budget's bottom line kill a project, but he'd already moved on to new things. Walt abandoned his Disneylandia project partly because of the cost, but also because he could finally afford to do what he really wanted. The success of Cinderella and Treasure Island, 
in addition to the income from merchandise and licenses, meant Disney could turn even more control over to department heads at the studio and focus on his dream project. With the drawings of Harper Goff and Don DeGrady, Walt went to the Burbank Parks and Recreation Board. With a set of concept art that now included a canal boat, a space rocket, and a submarine ride, Walt pitched the board on the idea of his park. He emphasized that the park's business would not be, quote, full bore money making scale. He was trying to create a place that entertained, educated, and comforted. His park would be Disneyland. The board reluctantly approved Walt's request to start exploring the amusement park idea. Now, the day before his 51st birthday, Walt watches the crowds gathering around Granny's cabin. The display, set up at the Festival of California Living in LA's Pan Pacific Auditorium, is so popular the festival's employees have to shoo one group away so that the next can see it. Walt stands back in the shadows across the room lest he be recognized. 21 months ago, almost two years, he abandoned his project for a miniature town. The experience had been useful though, for one, Walt needed artists and sculptors like the ones he worked with on Disneylandia to make the designs and scale models for turning his dream park into a reality. For another, it provided Walt an escape, a means to experiment and create, while studio business and finances kept him from pursuing his dream. As the group's cycle passed, a young boy notices Walt and approaches him for an autograph. Walt signs it, then walks away before he gets mobbed. He checks his watch. He's got to get back to the studio. His brother Roy's putting the final touches on a deal that will establish Walt as the head of a separate company, funded by the studio, that will eventually bear his initials. W-E-D, or WED. WED. <laughs> 